Welcome everybody. Good morning. Welcome to St. Columba Church. It's very good to see you all here. And there's a few special welcomes that I want to start with this morning. Um, welcome. Jeff is part of our church. But I want to say welcome to Jeff because he is he's just covering everything today. So yes, oh round of applause. Who knows why we're clapping, but we're doing it already. Yeah. So lots of people are off ill or injured and, and not, not able to help with the setup and things. So the band today and Jeff have done extremely well to get everything together to get us going. So we do just want to thank you guys. Well done. Now, now you can clap. <laughs> we also want to say a really big welcome to Rachel and to Jimmy and Ida. And Isla is just, just down there as well. Uh, who are here from Compassion. It's really good to have you. We're going to be hearing from Rachel and Jimmy in a little while in our gathering. But can we just say welcome to these guys as well? And you are welcome. You know, God says come. Come and worship. Come and worship God who says, you can call me Father. Worship me as the Father who loves you. Come just as you are, not as you'd like to be, but just as you are. Come and worship God as Father. Come because God says, you're invited. You are chosen. You are welcome. You are loved. I want you with me. Come and know me. Let's stand together and let's worship God.
Amen. Please have a seat. Yes, Father, we thank you that because uh, you have described yourself to us as Father, because that's the kind of God you are, we are chosen, adopted children in your family. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Okay, just a few notices for you, and then we're going to have our Bible reading today. So we are heading towards the summer holidays. Slightly muted cheer. Yes, Finley, exactly. Yes. Now, the thing about the summer holidays is we'll be back to meeting weekly in Drummond during that time. I know lots of people will be away on holiday doing different things through the summer. And uh, those who aren't away, though, we're, we're away at different times. It's good if we can have something for the kids during those weeks. And we need help for that. So we need volunteers. So it wouldn't necessarily be the people that are running our kids' groups through the term time. We are looking for volunteers who can help with uh, playing games with the kids. We don't do teaching during the summer. We just do hanging out and playing inside, outside, in the back at Drummond there. Uh, and so we need volunteers for that. And we need people to do that each week over the summer holidays. And we need two people each Sunday. We need one of those people at least to have PVG clearance through the church. But the other person may not have that because they are volunteering in this one-off way with somebody else who is, then that's okay to do it that way. So volunteers are needed. And if you can help with that, we're just looking for one week that you could do during the summer holidays. You know when you're away and you know when you're still around. One week that you could do. And instead of listening to me going on about something, you can play with the kids. Yes, yes Finley. He's got the hang of it. Uh, and so if you can help with this, please would you speak to Sarah, to Sarah Don. So you can be in touch with her, give her a call, a text, an email, Get in touch with Sarah to let her know that you could help. Uh, right, I did have some other notices. They're here somewhere. Oh, yes, if it's your first time here, you're very welcome. It's very, very good to have everybody here. Whether it's your first or your 40th or your 500th time here, you're very welcome. There's toilets for everyone. And they're in the foyer. Yes, no, you're, yes, Finley. There's even toilets. And they're there in the foyer. There's a boys, there's a girls, there's a disabled one. There's plenty of space for changing and things there too. Now... In two weeks' time, when we're back at Drummond School, we're going to be having a photo. Yes, exactly. Finley's the only one who's excited about that. We need some new photos for our new updated website. Not yet. Our new updated website that's coming. Coming soon. New website. We need new photos. And so we're going to take maybe a group shot in two Sundays' time. So everybody who's straightened their hair for today, because you heard it might be happening today, it's going to be in two weeks' time. I'm going to do a group photo. And also just some shots of kind of church life uh, that's happening on a Sunday morning. So in the kids' groups, here in the hall. So do come. Don't be like, I don't like photos, so I'm not coming. If you come in two weeks, you don't want to be part of a photo, you simply tell the person with the camera, get away from me. And that's fine. Everybody else will be in a photo. That's just fine. Dot's really looking forward to it, I can see already. Good. Also, we've been thinking it'd be nice to have a, a picnic together, uh, a church family picnic. And uh, just to say today, maybe we do that in two Sundays' time as well. So um, two Sundays from now is whatever the date that is, the 23rd or something. 20, 26th, thank you. It's your birthday? Oh, we'll sing Dot Happy Birthday in two weeks' time. Uh, so she'll have her photo done, she'll have a song, and, uh, and maybe even a picnic. And what? Uh, does anyone want to give Dot a makeover in two weeks' time? Any volunteers, please speak to Dot. You can email her, text her, give her a call. Um, so just keep your eye on the emails about that, about where we might do that, whether we do it, what the weather's going to be like. That would be great. Okay. Unless Donna goes, Scott, oh, remember this, then let's uh, read our Bible passage together just now. So we're going to uh, read today from Ephesians chapter 1. Yes, it's the Bible, Finlay. It's good. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses, uh, we're just going to read verses 1 through to 14. Ephesians 1, 1 to 14. And we've been looking at this series in the infinitely full of life. As you listen to Ephesians 1, you will hear some of the things we've already celebrated about how life is infinitely full of in Jesus. And some new stuff that we're going to think about today. today. So Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 16, uh, 1 to 14, sorry. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, 
by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus, so to the Christians in this place called Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, or that could be translated, those who believe in Jesus. Grace, God's gift, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, God predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, his gift that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also, here's that word again, chosen. We were chosen. Having been predestined according to the plan of God who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in, in Jesus Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you, and you also were included in Christ. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, and having believed it, you heard it, and having believed it, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I find that like quite intense, difficult language sometimes, but also quite like sing-songy, celebratory about all that, that God has done. We're going to have to think about a few things that are infinitely fuller about our life in Jesus from that passage in a wee while. But before the kids go through to your group today, kids, you will be with Sheena. You can, you can do the cheer again now. Yeah, Sheena. Sorry, Mum Jillian, for, for all that. But yeah, it's exciting to have Sheena. Uh, and Lorna, also to Lorna, quickly. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and possibly Simon if needed. <laughs> so before the kids groups go through, uh, we're going to introduce you again to you. Rachel uh, is going to come and we're going to hear from Jimmy a bit later on too. Rachel's going to come and tell us a little bit about compassion, who they are, what their ministry is. Uh, and kids, you're going to see a little something of that before you go through as well. I promise I'm not going to sound. I, uh, well, good morning. It is so lovely to be here with you today. It's um, a real pleasure and a privilege. It's one of my favourite parts of my job is to get to come and visit different church families on a Sunday morning. And it's, uh, yeah, so thank you so, so much for having me today. Boys and girls, I have some questions to ask you this morning. Do you think you can answer them for me? Yeah. They're just yes or no. And yes, you just need to stick your hand in the air. No, you just kind of sit like that or sit in your bum, whatever. Okay, I just need to put your hand in the air if the answer to the question is yes. And don't do it if it's no. So, hands up if you had, actually adults, you can answer these questions too. Hands up if you had breakfast this morning. Who had breakfast this morning? Just of you. I'm actually, I have to keep my hands down. I didn't have time for breakfast this morning. So, well done if you had breakfast this morning. I know that's terrible. Breakfast is very important. Hands up if you are going to school tomorrow or nursery. Hands up if you... Actually, how do I hear homeschooled? Some people I know are homeschooled as well. Yes, well, woohoo, that's brilliant. 
good cute, good job, you guys. So you go to school, you've had your breakfast, hands up if you've ever been not well. Yeah. And what normally happens if you're not well? Do you have medicine if you're not well sometimes? Are you able to get medicine if you need it? Or can you go to the doctor? Is it easy to go to the doctor? Yeah. Now, these are all things that are really important, isn't it? It's really important that you have breakfast or your lunch or your dinner. It's really important that you're able to go to school because what happens when you go to school? What happens after school? You can answer. What happens at school? You'll learn. And what happens with all the things that you learn? Yeah, you learn to read and to write. And then as you grow up, the things that you learn at school are things that help you then get adults. What do you have after you finish school? What do you have? A job. (laughs) Which isn't quite as exciting as it sounds, baby. What is that you were going to say? Yeah, you go, yes, you go to primary school, then high school, then you need to go to college or university, and you get a job. And yeah, there's lots and lots of things that happen after you go to school. And it's important to be able to go to the doctor and to get medicine if you need it as well, because that's the things that help you stay well and healthy. And all those things are really important. But at Compassion, we work with children who don't have those same opportunities. So when they wake up in the morning, they maybe don't have breakfast. What do you have for breakfast? What do you really like to have? What do you like for breakfast? Toaster cereal. Toaster cereal, good choices. What do you normally have? Porridge, oh, great start. What do you have? Cereal. Cereal as well. But for some boys and girls in the world, they maybe don't have the opportunity to have breakfast because they can't afford to have it. Their mum and dad aren't able to buy them breakfast or maybe not able to afford to buy them lunch or dinner. So when they get up in the morning, they aren't able to have the breakfast and then they're not able to go to school because their mum and dad can't afford to pay for them to go to school. And if they're not well, they're maybe not able to go to the doctor because you have to pay money to go to the doctor, should you believe you have to be able to afford to go to the doctor. So medicine isn't something that's easily accessible. Education is it, and neither is food. And what do you think that's like? Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? What do you think? It's a hard life. It's really hard, isn't it? Do you think? Well, it's not for me to say it's hard, but I think that would be really difficult, wouldn't it? So how do you think you would feel if that was you? Any idea? How do you think? Yeah, it must be really hard. Yeah, Mickey, do you think you'd be feeling happy with that? Do you think you're feeling sad with that? How do you think you'd be feeling? Yeah? Sad. Quite sad, yeah. So at Compassion, we've been working with people over 60 years for a really, really, really long time. That's older than some of your mums and dads. Well, probably all of your mums and dads. You're all really young. <laughs> Sorry, growing up. But yeah, so we've been working for a really long time with those children and their families. And you know how we do it? We do it through their local church, which I love. I love that we do it through the church because the church, like the fact that you're here today, the fact that you're sitting and you're part of church is an amazing thing because actually the church, if you know, when Jesus sent out his disciples, when he said, go into all nations and make disciples, baptizing them and doing all these great things, you know how he's going to do it? He's going to do it through his church. And it's not through the building, it's through his people, it's through you and it's through me. And it's through these ordinary people in their community that God really makes a difference. So we work with these children and their families through their local church and their community. And we do what we do in Jesus' name. Now, hands up if you're here and you know who Jesus is. Now, we do what we do in Jesus' name because actually food is great and education is great and work is great and healthcare is great. But actually, Jesus is the best news in the whole world. And actually, even if you are hungry and even if you are unwell and even if you aren't able to get a job and even when life is really hard, you are still the, one of the richest people in the world if you know who Jesus is because actually he gives us a hope that goes beyond our life. Now, he gives us a hope of heaven. He gives us the, the hope of eternal life. He gives us a hope that our sins are forgiven. Jesus is incredible. And he is just, if you know Jesus, you have everything. You have, it's great to have those things. And we work what we, we, and we do what we do so that people can have an education and food and healthcare and all those things that are really important, all, the, all those opportunities and to have hope. But true hope is only found in Jesus. And so we do what we do and tell these children about Jesus so that they can find the hope and the joy that there is to be found in him. Does that make sense? So is that, Yeah. Okay, and I'm really excited today. You're all very privileged today because normally I've got videos to show and I can possibly have a video show. I'm not sure. There might be a shorter one. If not, you can just pretend I never said that. But you're really, like, it's a real privilege and a real honour for me today to be able to welcome Jimmy and Isa with me this morning. I don't know if, uh, if you guys just, uh, we're going to, yeah, over there. We've had Jimmy and Isa. <laughs> They're, um, yeah, they are two very special people and uh, it's a real privilege for them for me to be able to have here this morning with them. So it's one thing for me to tell you about what Compassion does. It's one thing for me to stand here and tell you about 
statistics and what it's like to, to grow up in poverty. But Jimmy and I, I can actually tell you what that's like because that was their life once. They like, grew up, and I'll let Jimmy share that with you. But it's a real privilege for them to be here in Isla as well. Lovely little you shiny baby Isla. She's only six weeks old, so it's really exciting for me to be able to have her here today. And Jimmy's going to come up a little while, and we're going to have a little chat about his story and the difference that being sponsored by Compassion made in his life. But it's, um, yes, I'm looking forward to doing that with the grown-ups. But, um, yeah, no, it's Compassion works. Looking at Jimmy and Isla, Compassion works because it doesn't just change life from the outside in, it changes life from the inside out. Because actually, you know, we can change somebody's physical circumstances, we can give them meals, we can provide every outside opportunity possible, but actually only the Holy Spirit, only Jesus changes lives from the inside out. And that, that, that makes a huge difference, it gives you that hope that for that future. And if you're here today and it's your first time and you're thinking, what is she talking about? Who is this Jesus? Who is this, what is this gospel? And can I just encourage you to ask somebody about that? I encourage you to, to dig deeper into who Jesus is because life is hard, we know that. Things are a bit difficult and a bit scary just now. It's been a bit weird. We've not been at school, we've not been at work in the same way. Maybe, you know, things have been hard. Maybe we've lost people that we really love and maybe now we're kind of thinking, what is next week going to look like or next month or next year? We just don't know. But what we do know is that God is good. The victory is ours through Jesus Christ and it's, um, yeah, it's the most wonderful, wonderful thing. So, um, yeah, so I'm just going to pass on. I think we have the video, Scott. Possibly, Jeff. Yeah, you know, Jeff up the back. If not, I could try and sort of reenact it, but I'm not very good. You really don't always have to do that. I don't know. I'm, I'm quite up for seeing what that would look like. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then we'll invite Jimmy to come up and share. Great, so kids, it's time for you guys to go through with Sheena and Teen, and we'll see you guys at the end of the service. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, I was born and bred in Uganda. I think I'm loud enough. <laughs> Can anyone hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I was born and bred in Uganda, and uh, I moved over to Scotland to study. Uh, but growing up in Uganda, uh, uh, my mum moved from a, country, a small country called Rwanda during the Rwandan genocide. And when they moved to Uganda, they were refugees. Uh, that's when I was first, uh, I, came, I came to be born. And uh, uh, at that time, there was so much poverty in our home. Uh, but God provided in his mysterious ways. And uh, at the time, uh, I, I was young, but I kind of, it kind of sometimes reflects in my head how it used to be. It just used to be normal kids playing around. And uh, I've come from a family of seven, so my mom had to get my elder sister to leave to stay with my uncle when they back, when they went back to Rwanda after the war. But we stayed in Uganda with my mom, uh, and uh, it was very challenging, really hard. But as I was having a, a kickabout with my friends, uh, playing football, and out of the blue, the man came and said, "Would you want to stand here for a picture and would we'll get a photo of you?" That's how God chose me to be a compassion child. Does that describe Absolutely. how I was born? Yeah. So you said that there was a lot of poverty in your home when you were growing up. So yeah. what did that mean for you? Like, what did that look like? So what, what meant, uh, so there wasn't like, like the way kids, when you wake up and have porridge, and there was, you could get porridge every now and then, but it wasn't like, there was no secure, guaranteed medical facilities, or if you're going to get ill, you straight away to get for malaria you'd get paracetamol or panadol instead of getting ma malaria treatments so they could just improvise what was there but you couldn't quickly get that straight away to the main hospital to get treated but compassion played our part that they provide our medical assistance to us when we are child when we are children and they could rush us to the closest hospital and pay the bills so that's how poverty was like there was food, you could find food every now and then, but you weren't sure of what next day is going to bring. Mm -hmm. But God provided in mysterious ways. And through compassion, you could attend our church, and you could get meals at the church. So it kind of played out the balanced diet, I would call it. <laughs> yeah, so you were then sponsored through compassion. Can you tell me a bit about your sponsor? Who was it that sponsored you, and what did that process look like? All right, so my sponsor... Uh, so after being chosen, and of course I still call it being chosen, uh, my sponsor, uh, Mr. Uh, Thompson, uh, Thompson, used to write to me and tell me how much he loves me and how I'm special and how I grew up to be a great person. I didn't know all of this, but he used to write a lot of good things to me and tells me that Jesus loved me. And then going to compassion, I was from a, pro a Protestant family, but when I, And uh, uh, we used to exchange letters back and forth, and most of telling me about Jesus, and also I used to tell him about my life and how my mom and my brothers and what I wanted to be when I grow up and all that. So that's how it was. Yeah. Like, my sponsor is the relationship we had. That's amazing. So your sponsor made a huge difference in your life then and helped you. What did what did difference did that make? Absolutely, it did. I, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't because uh, I mean my village I barely speak a word of English. But when we went to the project, we used to be taught how to speak English and how to write. Uh, but on top of that, he paid my school fees in school. And therefore, I had an opportunity to go to a good school within the region. And uh, after the school, we then got an opportunity to come here to study. And, but compassion always had something that they told to us how to live it, like how to trust in Jesus, but how to believe in God, how to have hope for the future. And all that, all that was instilled in me, and I grew up to come over here and chase my dreams. Absolutely, no, that's great. So what difference then did being sponsored by Compassion make in your life? Compared uh, to what it would maybe have been otherwise, how yes. did God provide for you through that? How did God change your life through that? <coughs> the first thing is knowing Jesus Christ. If it wasn't Compassion, I think I would have been either a Catholic, they know Jesus, but I would have been a Catholic or a Protestant or somewhere, only be... Compared to my friends who grew up in the same village, uh, I, I would have been in a very worse position. But God picked me out, and through compassion, I had an opportunity to grow up and have a life. Amazing. Yeah.
Yes, and it also played a very big part in my family because my brothers and sisters also looked at me as an example and the boys, they now already know Jesus Christ and they go to school and they finish some of them finish university, some of them have an opportunity to come here and finish university. So it's so great news that God can just transform through compassion one child and the entire family has been transformed. And that's your lovely wife, Ida. Yeah, yeah. My wife, Ida, she's just about 25, 30 minutes away from my house. And the passion used to be all these school chair union and youth groups coming together. And I met Ida. We were friends at first, even when we were of age. And we used to meet every now and then, every summer. We call it a summer. Uh, but sorry, summer in Uganda. So if you ever want to visit, it's a beautiful place to go. Uh, but uh, we used to meet and then we became friends. And then... Uh, coming abroad and then uh, when, my heart, when I was ready to find love, then I, I reflected back to Ida and God met us and we got married and we're living here together. With your little girl? With my little girl, my baby Ida, who is a, who is a miracle and God has perfected her. Uh, I mean, when I look at Ida and the way I was born, I don't even know whether I was born in a hospital or on the streets, <laughs> but baby Ida has had an opportunity to go to born in a hospital. And there's kids who are born who, who don't even know their date of birth. And date of birth is called the day of just of compassion. So that, that, the, the deep hole, you know, and looking at my baby girl and having an opportunity when she was born to consult this and a team of people ready to help her, you know, it shows you how different that is to people in Uganda that just needs only one sponsor to raise them to the next level of it's a long-term commitment, but you give whatever you can give, and you, before you know, an entire life and their generations is transformed. So, like you're a walking testament of that, because <laughs> I love hearing you share. Like, your I mean, story. yes, my, my story is there. I mean, uh, some after growing up and visiting different countries and employments and all that, I've seen so much in the world. It may not just be Uganda. It could be Malawi. It could be Philippines. It could be Afghanistan. Now. And I saw people desperately in need, and not just in need of help or food or what, but in need of Jesus Christ. And I think we can do that for them. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure, God willing, my baby will have known Jesus Christ. And that, if we could just sponsor a child in Afghanistan, in anywhere, in Ukraine, anywhere, you know, we could just transform a life and a generation, yeah. like how my baby girl will be. Absolutely, yeah, I'm sure. So, our final, final question then before we wrap up and pass back to Scott. If there's somebody here today who's thinking, I'm interested, but I'm not sure I want to do this, if this is something I'd like to do, yeah. what would you say to somebody? And what would you say to your sponsor as well? What so, would you say to the person? I mean, not long ago, I went to visit uh, one of our sponsors, Ada, and his mom and dad in America. And great, we had a long time. We, we think we, they, they, they adopted us. I mean, they, they are our parents. I call our mom and dad. And I would say to you that please reach out. One child, two children. Just give them a life. And it is hard. It's a long-term commitment. But it's something that just leave it to God and just help help them out. Uh, before you know, God will, will transform a life. And it's not the money you give. It's just the prayer. Even praying for them is very important. We may not give, but just pray for them. Find a child and pray for them. Just give her whatever you can. Mm -hmm. And God will transform her life. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, always so lovely to have you have you with me. And if you would like to get more involved, if you would like to sponsor a child or to just chat to us after the service, then we'll, we'll be through where the kids are at the minute. There's, we've got some profiles of children who are all from one church in Uganda. So if that is something you'd like to do, then I would just, as Jimmy said, encourage you to do it. It's a... Um, Today is a very ordinary day, it's, you know, still to do, and it's a Sunday, I don't know what your plans are after, but it could be a day that has echoes in eternity because of what you've done for one person, and, um, and I would just encourage you to do that if you're able to, but we'd love to chat to you after as well, if you've got any questions, if you've, if you've got anything like to say, then please do come and chat to us after the service, we do love to talk, don't we? But again, we may be people here already sponsored, we really thank you yeah, for the absolutely. job you're doing here and helping out, and you know, it's hard, but God bless you so much for the job you're doing.
there's like quite a lot of people in between in this conversation. So maybe just hook up over coffee. That's great. Listen, let, let's just pray quickly as well for, for you guys. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's, let's just pray. Father, thank you uh, for Jimmy and Ida and Isla being here. Thank you for um, your choosing them and for uh, your transforming their lives. Thank you that you have done that in our lives too. May we as your church respond to the call to be people who get involved in your mission of bringing a choosing and bringing a transformation into life as well in Jesus' name. Lord, would you bless Rachel? Would you bless her work uh, as she spreads the word, as she shares, as she makes opportunities known? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. We're going to sing again, uh, and then Gillian's going to come and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, thank you that we can come to talk to you now and we know that you want to listen to us. You are gracious and compassionate, kind and loving, faithful and true. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that your mercies are new to us each morning. So often we find ourselves struggling and filled with worry and care. 
we need reminders to hand over our struggles and cares to you. You promise us peace and hope for the future. Help us to know deep down your peace and hope. And on those days when we struggle to do that, help us to actively and bravely trust that you will fulfill your promises to us. Thank you for all that you have given us. We have cars to drive, houses to live in, food to eat, and so much more than many people who live on this planet. Help us to be good stewards of all the things and the life that is given to us. As we begin another week, help us to be faithful to who you have called us to be in the circumstances we find ourselves in. Thank you that in each interaction we have and each situation we are in, we can be used by you to show your great love and compassion to others. And as we look to the wider world, we are so thankful that you are the one who sits on the throne in heaven and who has everything under your control. We see war and destruction, suffering and pain, and a world which so often is out of sync with your will. We pray in particular for Ukraine, which has been torn apart by war, resulting in indescribable pain and suffering. We pray, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done in that place. We are so thankful that you have given the gift of free will and that we are not robots. But as we look at the effects of sin and people turning away from you, we are thankful that everyone will be answerable to you as to how we lived our lives and one day you are returning as judge. And now we spend a few moments bringing what's on our hearts before you, knowing you are listening and want to talk to us. Father God, we bring our prayers to a close, knowing we pray in the name of Jesus, our advocate before your throne, who gives us the encouragement and the strength to face this coming week. In his precious name, amen. Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, folks, uh, it's a shorter sermon today. Honest it is. Honest it is. How much shorter we'll see. But just one question for you today. Uh, and you can think about this for yourself, uh, if you want to just think, if you want to have a chat to the person next to you, you can do that. But we've no time for small talk, it's straight into the deep and personal questions. Who are you? Who are you? What, uh, how, how, what defined you? How would you um, begin to answer that? What are the various things that shape your sense of identity? Is it the place that you come from? Is it your date of birth? Is it, you know, is it the team you support? Is it the job that you do? What are the various things that shape who you are? And what's the single biggest factor that defines you? If there is one, we can talk about such a thing. All right, so a couple of minutes to think or to chat about that.
Okay, just at the sweet spot of deconstruction that you're in at the moment, let's stop you there. And uh, let me just get some ideas from you. What are some of the different factors that shape our identity? Call some out for me. It's good talk. Oh, round of applause. Okay, so gender. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. Upbringing. Yeah. Cheers, James. So who you're married to? Is, is, is that really how it goes in Inverness? Oh, who's that guy? Oh, that's Laura's husband. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Yeah. Job, what job you do? That's what we do when we meet people, isn't it? Who are you? What do you do? Parents. Sorry? Parents. Parents, yes. Their influence upon you? Religion. Religion, yes. Big identity mark for, for many people. Which country you're from? Which country you're from, yeah. What age you are? Yeah. Lots. That's good. Your goals. Your goals can define you. If I was to ask you, what do you think for you or, or for people generally would be the single biggest factor that defines your identity? What do you think you'd say? The purpose that God has given me. The purpose that God's given you. That's a lovely specific answer. So it's not just Jesus. It's the purpose that God has given you. That's very interesting. Thank you, Charlotte. Loved by God. Loved by God. It changes daily. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So it can shift. Great to be in a church where uh, the, the church is saying it's Jesus and it's and it's God and it's and it's that's who we are. That's good. That is the answer. We're going to read that. But I think that for many people, um, family, I would suggest, is the biggest thing. Uh, that people would see shapes who they are, what their identity is. If you were to ask the man and woman on the street what it was and they really thought about it, they would probably say family. Family is the most important thing. Nothing more important than family. That's what people say at Christmas. We've been looking at the infinitely fuller life that people have when they believe in Jesus. And throughout this whole series, we're saying it is different. It's infinitely different to know Jesus than to not know Jesus. And Ephesians 1, the verses that we read we heard again some of the truths we've already looked at in this series. So life in Jesus is infinitely fuller because it's the only forever life. There is no one who lives forever except for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's infinitely fuller. That's different. And we read about that in Ephesians 1. The times reaching their fulfillment when all things in heaven and on earth are brought together under one head, even Christ. Our life is infinitely fuller because it is the forgiven life. You guys were talking about that as well. It's the forgiven life. We who know Jesus were chosen before the dawn of time, Ephesians 1 says. For what? The first thing it says we were chosen for was to be holy and blameless in God's sight. God chose us to be forgiven, innocent people in his view. God has lavished on us, it says, the gift of the forgiveness of all our sins through the blood of Jesus, verse 7. So twice it's telling us. It's infinitely fuller because we're forgiven. And Paul opens here with the blessing of peace from God. That's the, the thing about the infinitely fuller life we're going to look at in two weeks' time. Peace. How that is different for the Christian to anybody else. All of these things are for believers in Jesus, distinctly. It's to the faithful in Christ Jesus, to the believers in Jesus, Paul writes in verse 1. He says, you were included in Christ when you heard and believed the word about him. And then you got this infinitely full of life. It's all through faith in Jesus. It's only there. And then there's this. This is a big story in Ephesians 1. Life in Jesus is infinitely fuller because we're made part of God's family part of his family. Verses 5 to 6. In love, God predestined us to be adopted as adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Again, it's only through Jesus Christ. In accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. In other words, it is God's choice 
and it's God's delight and it's God's freely given gift to adopt you as his child. It's his delight, it's his choice and it's his gift to adopt you as his child. He loves you. God loves you. God wants you. You know, that's the great thing, isn't it, about being adopted? Is, is you know you're wanted. Deliberately chosen. I love, Jimmy, that you kept using that word chosen about your experience. I'm chosen. I'm wanted. God wants you. He adopts you. You're of infinite value to him. Now, it's very easy for us in life some of us will struggle with this more than others. To believe the lie that the world has told you or that you've told yourself. That you're worth nothing. Because God values you so much that his son Jesus bled and died to redeem you. That's why I'm telling you, you are of infinite value to God. That is the price that he paid for you. Verses 13 to 14 describe the Holy Spirit that's given to believers in Jesus as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. First time I ever read that, I thought that meant that, okay, so, you know, the Holy Spirit's a guarantee that I'm going to inherit stuff from God. I'm going to have life forever with him. I'm, I'm going to have the good stuff of eternal life. And I think that is in this. I think that is, is what this is saying, but actually more what this is saying is that God's going to inherit you. God's inheritance is you. That's what he treasures. That's what he is looking forward to having for all time. And this is not, you know, it says you're, you're God's possession, verse 14. Not like, you know, a tool or a toy or a slave but possessed as a truly, deeply loved and cherished child of God. So that's who you are. That's your identity. And some of you go, ah, I'll decide that. We'll get to that in a minute. All of this happens, Paul says, just through Jesus Christ. We're adopted as his sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. It's because God has always been father to Jesus that as we are united with Jesus in faith, God becomes Father to us. That's why it's only for Christians, for, for believers in Jesus, that we call God Father. Because it's Jesus that has the right to do that, and it's Jesus that says, share in that with me. Share in that with me. One of the revolutionary things that Jesus did when he came to this world was to describe God as Father. Now, we hear the Lord's Prayer and we're like, yeah, I heard that. Our Father who art in heaven, that's how we talk to God. Like, before Jesus came and said, when you talk to your Father, everyone was like, what did you just call him? Like, the Jews in the Old Testament could not utter the name of God because it was so holy. Rightly so. No other religion, no other worldview in this world can, can call God Father as Jesus came to this world and said, my, God is my Father. And I'm telling you, you can call him Father now. Call him Father. I'm here to tell you that you can call him that too. I'm here to tell you that you can know God the way I know him as Father. To experience the kind of intimate, lovely, wonderful relationship with the author of all creation that I have. When you read through the Gospels, you read Jesus speaking, you get the impression that he really loves his dad. You know, he's just delighted to be the son of God the Father. He says, I want you to have that too. I want to show you who God is. I want to show you what he's like. And I'm going to die for you to make it possible for you to come right in close with God now and forever. I'd like you to listen to some of the things that Jesus said about this. I'm going to get uh, my readers up again today. There's four short passages and if you've, you guys could come up, uh, and we're going to hear the words of Jesus, speaking of God as Father. just want you to hear the language he uses across uh, the New Testament, across the Gospels. So can we have the four of you up? That's Heather and Colin, Simon, well, thanks. So I mentioned the Lord's Prayer. I mentioned Jesus teaching us this. Just listen to how many times um, Jesus uses the word Father. 
when he's teaching us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 6 to 9. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. This would have been totally surprising to Jesus' first friends, to call God Father. But Jesus says it again and again. He's your Father. Call him Father. I think that's probably still a surprising idea today to those who don't know Jesus. So trying to get my head inside you know, the mind of someone who doesn't know Jesus. It's been a long time since I was like that. So, you know, I'm assuming. But like, it doesn't feel like they think of God as Father or they think we think of God as Father. But that is what we know him as. That's what we're really talking about. That at his invitation, God is, is telling us to think of him as the perfect parent. Being completely real with him, trusting him. And the way that Jesus spoke here, believing that God knows us so well as a father that we don't need to try and get the words right. Like living like whatever is going on, we really think that he's got us and he's got a watch over us. You know, I think my kids just sort of go about knowing it's okay because dad's watching me. It's, it's like that. Listen to Jesus speaking here in Matthew 12, 46 to 50 about who Jesus considers his family to be. Who's got Matthew 12? Matthew 12, 46 to 50. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So in your um, family life, are there people that aren't blood relatives of yours, but you think of them as family because they're so close to you? You might even speak of them in that way, like, you know, Uncle Colin for us in our house. And that's how Jesus feels about you, his disciples, his followers. He, he thinks of you that way. He really loves and thinks of and talks of you as his, his actual family, sharing with him the fatherhood of God. And Jesus really does want us to know the Father as closely as he does. I remember preaching about this once and seeing some, some funny looks. It was when we looked at John 17. We're going to hear a part of it again. But listen. Listen to the words Jesus uses. If he didn't say this, you would not dare to believe it. But listen to what Jesus says in John 17. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Did you hear that last bit? That you have God the Father, you have loved them, not the disciples that are immediately around him, those who would believe their message. You have loved them even as you have loved me, said Jesus. If Jesus hadn't said that, could you dare to believe it? That is how loved you are. That is how 
precious you are to God. Isn't that amazing? Jesus' prayer here, this is just before he goes to his death. So you know, if you're about to die, it's your moment to pour out your desire, isn't it? Like what's really on your heart. And what's really on Jesus' heart? I want people that haven't even been born yet who will hear this message about me. I really want them right in close. I want them right here with me. I want them right here with you, Father. That's what I want. Please make that happen. That's amazing, isn't it? You are very precious to God. He wants you as close as possible. I asked you at the start, what's the single biggest factor that defines your identity? I said, I think for most people, that's probably family. Here is the change that happens when someone puts their faith in Jesus. What becomes your primary identity marker is child of God. That is who you are. Uh, Will, who pretty much gave that answer earlier, uh, is going to read what John says about that in a, in a letter, First John. It's First John 3, verses 1 to 2. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet be yet been made known but we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is now we are children of god that is what we are is what john wrote there he said it a couple of times to make the point it doesn't diminish your love for your family if I, i'm standing here saying to you because you're a christian person your primary identity is child of God. That does not diminish your love for your family, how important they are, how important they are to you. In fact, my lived experience is that when you love God most, you love your family better. When you love God most, you love your family better. Child of God becomes your primary identity not because it is how you see yourself. It doesn't kind of matter in a sense how you see yourself, given that how God sees you is, you are my precious daughter. You are my precious son. See, if I make a cake, now I, I don't make cakes, that's why Heather's already laughing. Okay, if I make a cake, it's up to me what it's for. Yeah, I can make it and it might not be very good, but you, could, you don't get to tell me oh, that's for this person's, you know, leaving due or whatever. I'm like, no, I made that for, for Daniel's birthday. That's never going to happen. Heather's always going to make the cakes for the kids' birthdays. But it is the maker that gets to define the purpose, the identity, right? Same thing here. God, the maker, has said, I made you, and who you are to me is my precious child. So you're not some, like, impersonal, I don't really care if they're in this world or not. You are a loved child of God, chosen, adopted from before the beginning of time to be innocent in his sight and to really know him as father. Isn't that brilliant? That's who you are. And it doesn't matter if you're wrestling through an identity crisis about who you are. Well, it does matter. But the point is that when you're wrestling with what's my sexuality, what's my identity, what's my purpose in life, what is my, what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be like them? How do I stack up against them? None of that matters as much as the primary identity marker is you are a loved child of God. Because God says so. Sings it, sings it, sings it throughout the gospel as Jesus does. So, for those who hear and believe these things, let me encourage you to live in response like this. I'm wrapping up here. For people that like a practical, so what about what we do on Monday morning? I'm really just telling you God loves you. He really does, okay? But here's some stuff. Treat God as your father. Call him Father when you pray. If that's not your habit, start doing it. Start addressing God as your Father. Do it because that's how Jesus taught us to do it. And think of him in that way. It was quite revolutionary for me uh, when uh, fairly early on, into, well, it can't be that early on, when you Rutherfords came to join in with us, 2016, 
uh, Lorna sent me a card and it was just telling me this. She was reminding me of this truth that God is father and loves me as child. And it totally transformed the way that I prayed because I'd been in a point when I was just like, I don't know, feeling burdened or I'm not doing well enough or what's my, my function. And her card reminded me to know that God thinks of me and smiles on me. And it totally changed the way that I prayed and it freed me. So, you know, send some cards, people, to each other. See, it reminding us of these things. Treat God as your father. Call him father. Think of him as father. Now, we have all got different reference points of fatherhood in our lives. I know some of those experiences will be good. Some of those experiences will be bad. Some of them will have made you want to be the same kind of father as your dad or a really different kind of father as your dad. We all have variable experiences of fatherhood. But God is not your, heaven, your earthly father. God is your perfect father. He is everything that your dad was not. He is perfect. Whether you had a good dad or a bad dad or whatever. Okay? He is the perfect father that you can totally trust and open up with. Treat him that way. He gave everything he had to have your company forever. He's worth loving. Treat one another as your brothers and sisters. So if God's our father then that makes us family. This is where I need Finley to go. Yes. I love this family. I love you guys. And I do think of you as family. And we talk to our kids about the church family. And I know that other kids do that as well. They think of, of the church as family. We're brothers and sisters. So we need to treat each other that way. We need to have each other's backs. We need to spur one another on. We need to call each other out sometimes. But we need to love each other as brothers and sisters. Grow in the family likeness. We, uh, we're in this family through faith in Christ. And so now, grow in your lifetime into the likeness of our big brother. Grow more like Jesus. Uh, that's a lifetime project, but let's do it. Let's grow more like Christ year by year. Work in the family business. Let the things that are important to God the Father be the things that are important to us. So Charlotte is talking about what is, what is my purpose given from God. There is a unique and specific one for Charlotte and there is a purpose that we are all given as Christians. And, and when we're wrestling with, what, what, who am I, Lord? What am I supposed to do? First answer, open this and read it and do the things that God tells us to do and prioritize the things that are clearly a priority to God. Prioritize compassion. Prioritize justice. Prioritize making the word of God known to people who don't know Jesus yet. Like it's not rocket science. It's in here. Read it and imbibe it, and do the things that God says, this matters to me in this world. And finally, share in the family inheritance. Know that a day is coming, beyond the shadows of this world, where you will inherit all that God has in store for you. But more than that, where God, who's really looking forward to this, is going to inherit you forever. Let's stand together and sing once more before we close our service.
So now go, go and although you came as you are, go and never be the same again. Go and become all that God is making you to be. Go and make this family of faith in Christ known. Go and welcome people into it. Go and give compassion. Go and draw others into this family. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Guys, please, if you can, stick about for tea and coffee. Please grab uh, Rachel and Jimmy and Ida and, and Isla are here. If you want to get a, a, a chat, check out the compassion stand next door and see if you can make a difference today for eternity.